Our next speaker is the mayor of Chicago. There are a few things I'd like to share with you about the mayor. The City Club is enormously grateful to him and his wife, Amy, for visiting and speaking at Misericordia and Special Olympic events, which we support, like the breakfast scheduled right here on November 6th. And encouraging everyone to, quote, give back in the same rich measure they have received. I've mentioned this before, but the City Club of Chicago proudly takes partial credit for our part in the fabulous publicity which our next speaker earned by because he got Jimmy Fallon to come and jump into the lake for the Special Olympics, raising $1.2 million for children and adults with special needs. <laughs> the next point, I wanted to uh, thank our next speaker for his frequent attendance at City Club of Chicago events, like today, and encouraging his leadership team to speak. We appreciate that greatly. And once he earns the support of the city council for his new, uh, uh, what should I call it, new vision for the city, I would like him to honor us by coming right here and telling us, after he gets those 26 votes, uh, to tell us about his vision for the city. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Mayor? <clears throat> Somebody helped Jay. What happens in a couple of weeks is called a budget passing. Uh, and I know that the state of Illinois has put a pox on the idea of actually government working, but on the 28th, you can see it happen here in the City Council of the City of Chicago, Jay. Remember, but the good news is, Jay had it right. You need a minimum of 26 votes. So for you, Illinois and U.S. history, for 2,500. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction. I want to also thank the City Club for uh, uh, having this uh, forum for uh, Cheryl. Before I start, as somebody who makes it a habit of calling his parents every day, I want to compliment Cheryl's parents that are here. Uh, 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 that's a way of putting every one of you on notice, behave yourself. Uh, that's the Jewish mayor talking. Let me, uh, I want to say a couple things. I want to leave this uh, main thing for Cheryl. You all know that ConAgra moved their world headquarters out of Omaha last week, and they announced they're coming to the city of Chicago, 37th company to move their headquarters. <laughs> bringing 500 jobs. Chicago, two years running, is the number one city for corporate relocations in the United States of America. The number one draw, the reason 37 other companies have left other states or other parts of the state of Illinois to come to the city, talent. 35% of the people in the city of Chicago have a four-year college degree or better. In the United States of America, it's 27%. We have the institutions of higher ed, 15 of them in the city of Chicago, which is a major advantage outside of Boston. No other city has more. My other view also, and it's not just my view, we also have many, many graduates from the rest of the state, from Wisconsin, from Michigan, from Indiana. As I often say, on graduation day, do not get on a highway between Madison, Wisconsin, and the city of Chicago. You will be roadkill. <laughs> Ann Arbor, roadkill. South Bend, roadkill. Bloomington. I think you get the point, stay indoors. That is to our advantage which is why big, medium, and small companies are moving their headquarters and operations because we have the best trained, best educated, best skilled workforce. Now, about five years ago, four years ago, I was on the 35th Street L platform about to go do an announcement that we were going to redo the entire red line south. Governor was ahead of me and I was shaking hands. I hadn't gotten out of the campaign mode yet. And I ran into a young man standing waiting for his train. And I said, uh, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Target. I work in the back. I said, great. I said, where are you coming from? He goes, Harold Washington. 
I said, what, what do you study? He said, oh, I'm getting my business administration degree. I said, fabulous. Now, I walked away, and it's, this is one of the things I love about campaigning and politics, is you run into somebody and there's a moment and it just sticks with you until you solve it. And I thought to myself, you know, he is doing everything you would want him to do. Working full time, going to school full time, and he is betting when he's done that the reputation and the education he received at Harold Washington equals his aspirations. Six years ago, Harold, City College of the City of Chicago had a 7% graduation rate. It's the second largest system in the United States. One of the worst graduation rates. We were not holding up our end of the bargain. He was doing everything right. And the companies that are coming to the city of Chicago, do they want a Booth School, Kellogg School business graduate? Yeah. Do they want a graduate out of the University of Illinois Computer Science and Engineering School? Yes. Do they want somebody out of sales and marketing from DePaul or Loyola? Sure. We have to make sure, though, also that the reputation of Harold Washington, Malcolm X, Olive Harvey is good enough that we can provide every company and every student that goes there that they have the ability to have every employee the hardest working, best educated workforce. And that certainty will continue to have the flow of companies coming to the city of Chicago. And that's why what Cheryl's doing at the community college with her board and the leadership is essential not only to the students, but essential to the city of Chicago's economic vitality. It cannot be an afterthought. 60 years ago, it, was what, it is what trained and educated the greatest generation. And as we go into the 21st century, it is going to be the education model that continues to allow another generation of folks to enter the 21st century economy. And that is the revolution that's happening under your nose at the Community College of the City of Chicago. Because what's happening is, and I want to do if I can, there's a couple students I asked Cheryl to have here. Is Cornell McCollum here, if he could stand, please? Josh Rodriguez who is also in the kitchen today because he's a graduate of Kennedy King Culinary. Yeah. Cornell is from Harold Washington College, business and finance major, and he's going on to DePaul. Sherry Smith, are you here? Is Sherry here? Sherry's at Olive Harvey, Transportation Distribution Logistics, and now works for Coca-Cola. Trina Mack at Malcolm X. Is Trina here? She, there she is. She's a certificate for sterile processing and did internship at Rush and just landed a job in the healthcare profession. That is what's going on at our city colleges of Chicago. Every city across the United States has a commitment to kindergarten to 12th grade. With universal pre-K and now with the Chicago Star Scholarship that if you earn a B average, Community college is free. The city of Chicago is going from kindergarten to 12th to pre-K to college. The only city, and it's gonna ensure that our educational system reflects the economy of the 21st century, and that these students have a chance at competing and winning in that economy that's coming to the city of Chicago. In addition, I wanna say, just about a week, ago, about four weeks ago, those weeks start to blend in when you're dealing with the budget, Jay. Uh, <laughs> We announced at the University of Illinois, UIC, that if you maintain your B average, you're automatically matriculated into UIC and get a $2,500 uh, deduction on your tuition so that the kids can go to city colleges, the Chicago Star kids, for free for the first two years, maintain that B average, you now can go to UIC as well for the final two years. And I'm proud that today we announced that DePaul, Governor State, IIT, Loyola, and National Lewis, and Roosevelt all join UIC, that you have the opportunity, if you maintain your B average, the Chicago Star students, at community colleges, your, community, your next two years will be also uh, financially successful in the sense that your parents won't have to take a second job or a second mortgage to give you a shot at the American dream in the city of Chicago. All the things we talked about are because of Cheryl's leadership. I couldn't be prouder of what she's done over her tenure. I can't be prouder of what she's about to continue to do 
over the uh, next four years in building our community colleges. And not only just building them, not only putting a new building at Malcolm X and a new facility at Olive Harvey, but also ensuring that the students that depend on the community colleges for their education and their economic vitality have a chancellor who has their interests at heart as a former student. It is why Washington Monthly last uh, month noted 10 university uh, chancellors across this uh, country who are the most promising educational leaders in their field. And Cheryl Hyman was in that 10. We have something significant happening here in the city of Chicago we should take note as it relates to education. And because of Cheryl's leadership, her determination, and her commitment to another generation, we are all as a city so much better off. Ladies and gentlemen, Cheryl Hyman. Thanks, boss, for those words of wisdom that he just whispered in my ear that I won't share with anybody. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank Paul and Jay, who have supported City Colleges and supported me since my tenure and even before then. So thank you very much. And they also have a scholarship that they've created for our students. And so I thank all of you for buying tickets because it does help to fund those scholarships, so I thank you. Um, I want to thank my new board chair, uh, Chuck Middleton, who was the former president of Roosevelt uh, University. Now, Chuck, a, a few weeks ago, Chuck thought he retired um, from Roosevelt, but that's not the case. But don't worry, Chuck. Frank will tell you how to think you retired and then work in a public service, so he, he can help you out with that. Um, I'd like to also thank my other uh, City Colleges board members who are here. I've seen a couple of them in the room. And Chancellor Emeritus, thank you so very much because you were the first person to sign on for the STAR Scholarship Partnership, and I think you've paved the way for the other universities that the mayor has mentioned. Um, and then I have to thank uh, John Rowe, who surprised me today and took time out of his very busy schedule. Thank you so much. I think everybody knows what John Rose did for me and uh, my career. And then to my parents, who are literally responsible for me being here today. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Now back to my boss. Mary Manuel is a man of few words. Shortly, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that to be funny. I was actually really serious. Um, shortly after his first election in 2011, still in the very early days of our reinvention initiative, the mayor gave me a two-word mission, and that was double down. But now those two words were actually way longer than our typical conversations when the mayor just simply says, Cheryl, then he just stares. So it's, he really is a man of few words. But the great thing about the two of us working together is that we're both very patient people, and we're not at all competitive. <laughs> I did say that to be funny. Um, now it is true, however, that neither of us have time for complicated deliberations when decisive action is required. One example of that is the STAR Scholarship, which did not exist when I was here at the City Club last year. But the mayor and I both believe that the opportunity for a college education and a career mm -hmm. should not be determined by one's bank account or their immigration status, but by one's commitment and drive. So with few examples on how to do it, we created the STAR Scholarship, which as the mayor said, gives qualifying CPS graduates free tuition and books for up to three years at city colleges. Now, I'm hugely proud to say that this fall semester, the mayor and I welcomed the inaugural class of nearly 1,000 Chicago Star Scholarship recipients who come from more than 100 high schools all over the city of Chicago. So today, as a small token of our collective appreciation for his leadership and his support, here are some Star Scholarship recipients with the memento for Mary Manuel. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, if you look on the back, the students have signed it. All 900 signatures couldn't, or 1,000 signatures couldn't fit. So we put 1,000 stars on the big star. So count them when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> Thank you. Now the Star Scholarship illustrates our mindset, which is at the heart of my speech today. The mindset is summed up by City College's tagline, an education that works. And it works because we don't allow excuses. It works because we make it work. The staff make it work, the faculty make it work, the students make it work, the communities make it work, and we do it without excuses. Both the mayor and I have worked to create a culture within our organizations where the priorities are clearly articulated, where urgency is of the essence, and where people feel empowered to act. As City Colleges, our culture centers around student success. We evaluate our own success by whether our students reach their academic and professional goals. Are students completing their programs in a timely manner? Do they have the credits to successfully transfer to a four-year university? Do they have the skills to get a good paying job in a growing field? To fully live this student success philosophy, we have begun a difficult but vital move away from a culture where the fear of change reinforces the status quo to one where we embrace innovation, however disruptive it is to our own comfortable habits. The effort to revolutionize our culture started on my first day in 2010. We used data to give us an unvarnished glimpse of where we really stood, laid out clear goals, and insisted on daring new ideas instead of the excuses that once ruled the day. Now, often I was asked, well, Chancellor, why can't we do this or why can't we do that? And I would say, good idea, let's do it. But people often were taken aback because they were not used to being given a license to act. Well, preliminary data is in for fiscal year 2015, the fifth year of our reinvention initiative, and they show what you can achieve if you put the excuses out of your mind and you put your mind to making it work. Back in 2010, we were averaging about 2,000 degrees a year and had a federal graduation rate for first-time, full-time students, as the mayor said, of 7%. Now that was by any measure inexcusable. Today, our graduation rate stands at 17%, more than double the pre-reinvention rate. <laughs> this past academic year, we awarded nearly 5,000 degrees, up more than 100% since the mayor came to office, with more than 11,000 total completers. So Mr. Mayor, we literally can say we did double down. Before reinvention, our graduation rate was the second worst among the community college systems in America's top 10 cities. By 2013, the last year for which national data is available, our rate had improved 86% compared to an average of 5% for other colleges. We've surpassed Houston, Dallas, and Philadelphia, and we're closing in on Phoenix and New York. I know I said I wasn't competitive, I'm just stating a fact. <laughs> we, thanks. Thank you. We are not where we need to be, and we are nowhere near where we want to be. But we are already well on our way to proving wrong all those who doubted our students. The numbers, however, only are a mere barometer for the more fundamental undertaking that will determine whether our reforms are lasting and truly sustainable long into City College's future, and that is our change in culture. Recently, as the mayor said, I was named one of the 10 most innovative college leaders in America. Now, I have to tell you, the mayor told me, don't let it go to my head, so personally, <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> um, but I recognize this award and others are not a reflection on just me, but on the thousands of people at City Colleges who have embraced our call for high expectations and who are helping make reinvention a true success. The important point here is that I didn't receive the honor because of our graduation rate 
or some other data point. It was awarded specifically because we are challenging the status quo. We're driving change at scale and in the process overcoming many justifications for underachievement. The truth is that we will only realize reinventions for potential if collectively, from city colleges administrators to students, faculty, the public, and the media, we shed a legacy of excuses and instead figure out how to make it work. Too often there's a tendency to look everywhere but inward when we're not succeeding like we think we should. But more often than not, the problem like the solution lies in ourselves. Now this is a hard truth for anyone involved in this reform effort, one that could make some people uncomfortable and who may think I am insensitive to other struggles. But it's a truth I'm comfortable speaking because it's my truth. You see, I had to learn it myself first. I had to learn it on my own, but thanks to my parents who have shown me what it's like to beat the odds after overcoming many tremendous challenges themselves. My parents were the first people who taught me, you just have to figure out how to make it work. Anyone who says, once you move past excuses, there's no looking back, isn't being fully honest. These are not lessons that are learned once and for all. Each day, I have a conversation with myself, and I call myself and what I am doing into question. And when the excuses loom large in my own mind, I have to force myself to just focus on doing whatever it takes to make it work for the sake of all those who rely on it. Now, reinvention isn't just about telling people to make it work. Our job is to give them the tools they need to get it done. To do that, reinvention has been organized around four strategies. First, we had to make sure our programs were more relevant to the real world. Second, we had to create more structure for our students by giving them clear pathways to careers at four-year colleges. Third, we had to give our students more support. And fourth, we had to improve our operations so our reforms were long-lasting. Now the goal of relevance, our goal of relevance is to develop programs that deliver true economic value. The mayor and I launched College to Careers in 2011, and through College to Careers, our faculty and staff have worked with industry leaders and four-year universities to ensure our programs and facilities prepare Chicagoans for the 600,000 jobs coming to our region over the next decade in key industries. We aligned each one of our colleges with one of these seven areas with the highest forecasted jobs growth over the coming decade. Now, when I started at City Colleges, we had more than 200 programs. Some of these programs, employer told us, bore no relation to the job market. In other cases, market data indicated there were and would be plenty of jobs in a given field, but employers told us our graduates were never going to get these jobs with the skills we were teaching them. Now, based on that invaluable real-world input, we have discontinued 41 certificate programs and launched 22 new ones. Last year, we awarded 22% more certificates than before reinvention. And many of our certificates now are in such demand that students routinely already have jobs by the time they complete their program. We have more than 150 industry partners with more than 3,000 students hired since the mayor and I launched the program. Now these numbers are evidence that with the right mindset and the right partners, you really can make it work. But we're not the only ones to think so. A few weeks ago, journalist Ron Brownstein noted in the National Journal that Chicago, under the mayor's leadership, is one of the few cities in America with a job boom that is systematically working to connect the people who live in our neighborhoods to this job's growth. He noted that this connection is being made in Chicago through our work at city colleges. But even with all the proof and validation in the world, there are those who still say, we're taking students down the wrong path. Now that's especially true when it comes to what we call consolidation. As part of College to Careers, 
we have begun to move some programs among colleges. All healthcare, for instance, is headed to Malcolm X. And all transportation, distribution, and logistics is headed to Olive Harvey. Now, there are those who lament this new way of doing things as a supposed betrayal of our mission as a community college. My response is that the true betrayal was to once promise all things to all people and to deliver on too few promises to too few people. <laughs> now today, today, not every one of our programs is in every community. But for the first time in a long time, we can say we offer true opportunity to everyone in every community. Now people make excuses for our students, excuses we typically don't hear from students themselves. One leading excuse is that our students won't travel to attend college outside of their neighborhood. Now that troubles me on several levels because it reflects condescending and even insulting assumptions about our students. It suggests that they are not committed enough to go after what they want. It suggests that they won't or can't get out of their neighborhoods or their comfort zone. Well, you know what? I was once one of those students and I know what they are capable of. After graduating from Olive Harvey, I traveled first from my grandmother's home in Roseland to IIT for my bachelor's courses, then from my home south of the city to North Park University for my master's, and then from my job downtown to Northwestern in Evanston for my MBA. The facts show that when it comes to getting the education they want, our students too find a way to make it work. Now behind me are maps that show that each of our colleges already draws students from every corner of Chicago. Those maps also show that our students' comfort zone is whatever zone will advance their life's goals. So please, let's give our students a lot more credit. And because we recognize that students, faculty, and staff impacted by these changes might need to travel more, we created a free City Colleges shuttle bus system that better connects our colleges to the CTA and to each other. See, we found a way to, for everybody to make it work. Now to those students or those of us who don't or won't travel to seek the quality education they profess to want, here is a tough love message that I had to learn firsthand. The world is not coming to any of our doorsteps to give us anything. Opportunity may indeed knock, but we have to open the door and do our part. Students might as well learn that lesson now while in college before the real world teaches it to them the hard way. Employers won't build their facilities across the street from any of our homes just to make it easier for any of us to go to work. But our students are rising to the challenge and proving they respond to quality and opportunity. Today, nearly nine in 10 City Colleges credit students are enrolled on a college to careers pathway. But even so, a related excuse I hear too often is that consolidating programs in one location will disenfranchise the poor. Well, my response, lower quality education, however close to your home, won't break the cycle of poverty. The only way we will break the cycle of poverty is to choose quality over proximity. Now, thanks. Now, I too was poor. I know what it's like not to be sure where you're going to sleep at night. I know how financial instability can make you want to give up. But poverty makes you hungry. It does not deprive you the ability to learn. I too was once hungry, but I knew I could either listen to my empty stomach or trust my gut. But it's not enough for our programs to be relevant. We have to provide the students with the structure to put their goal within reach in a timely manner. So under this second strategy of structure, we have developed more than 100 semester by semester pathways in our college to careers focus areas to guide our students on the road to their transfer or career destination. We are also introducing demand-driven scheduling, which eliminates the traditional college schedule where classes are scattered throughout the week, 
It groups courses into blocks of time and gives students a view of their complete program starting day one, making it easier for students to plan work, family, and other responsibilities around their classes. But all this strategy too has had its share of detractors. An excuse I've heard is that our insistence on clear roadmaps will deny our students a chance to engage in self-discovery. That education should be about self-discovery. Well, now that's pretty funny to me. First off, our students never tell me their city colleges define themselves. What they tell me is that they are here to find a career and they simply want us to help them get there. As I found out firsthand, it's pretty difficult to engage in self-discovery or find anything else if you can't make the rent. So we set a goal that all City College's students would be on a pathway this fall. And by the end of this semester, we will have done it. We will have made it work. In creating clear pathways that link City College's programs to four-year colleges and careers, my goal is to spare current and future City College's graduates the setback experienced by one former Olive Harvey College student that I know well, and her name is Cheryl Hyman. In 1993, I proudly graduated from Olive Harvey College with my Associate of General Studies degree and headed off to the Illinois Institute of Technology to major in computer science. Oh, but I was in for a rude awakening. When I got to IIT, I found out many of my credits would not transfer and I went right back to being a sophomore. When I was at Olive Harvey, nobody laid out clearly what courses I needed to take. That contributed to me finishing my associate's degree in three years rather than two. And what's worse is 17 of the credit hours I took were not even transferable to IIT. Now I can tell you, those extra 17 credit hours sure didn't help me discover myself. <laughs> they cost me an additional year at IIT because of all the courses I had to take over, so it took me a total of six years to get my bachelor's instead of four. But today, not only do we have a pathway in IT and other academic areas that have been validated by IIT and other four-year institutions, so our students know their courses will be accepted for transfer. Now, the degree I received, the Associates in General Studies, or AGS for short, was a four-letter word by the time I became Chancellor of City Colleges because it lacked relevance leading to the problems I had experienced. But since then, we have integrated the AGS with our pathway systems so the students in the AGS take relevant courses. And since the AGS is the most flexible degree, it is the degree that can maximize transfer credit to a four-year college. But see, too often we get caught up in an alphabet soup debate about which associate's degrees are best. AA, AS, AAS, AGS, AAT, AES, AFA. Before Pathways, students had problems transferring credits with all those degrees, not just the AGS. But look, degrees alone don't transfer. Credits and people do. Today, our transfer rate to four-year institutions following graduation is up 9% since reinvention. But in addition to taking courses that did not transfer, I was also placed in remedial courses in both English and math that I probably did not need to take. And again here, I have walked in our students' shoes. About 90% of our students, no matter what high school they come from, CPS or not, come to us without being so-called college ready in English and or math. Now there's no shame in this for me. Having overcome it is just another way I show students and the excuse finders that a challenging start in college is not a death sentence for your dreams. Now I ace both of those remedial courses as well as harder classes in those same subjects highlighting a problem we are fixing. The tests often misplace students into remediation. So we're refocusing our own thinking on completion readiness 
rather than college readiness. Now that means we are looking at our students' true ability, their academic record, and their non-cognitive skills rather than simply test scores. Now I strongly dislike the word remediation, by the way. I believe remediation should be for buildings and not for human beings. <laughs> we are working to move past the entire concept by embedding academic skill strengthening into college work. The goal is to play on a student's strength rather than dwell on their weaknesses. Last year, 70% of new graduates started out in remediation, showing that with the right help, they too can make it work. Even with all those remedial students, we set another record for the most completions in City College's history. Our students' challenges didn't change, our mindset changed. Now the theoretical lack of college preparedness is most acute at Kennedy King College, where the percentage of remedial students is the highest among all our seven colleges. And yet, it is Kennedy King that was awarded the Rising Star Award by the Aspen Institute this past March for having tripled its graduation rate under reinvention to one of the highest in any community college anywhere in a large American city and the highest by far at city colleges. Now, thanks. Now, yes, yes, I am talking about Kennedy King College in Inglewood a neighborhood the media likes to paint solely with the brush of violence, ignoring this bright spot that literally saves lives through education every day. Now, did we transform Kennedy King by magically getting rid of our students' life and academic obstacles? No, we did it by getting rid of the excuses and telling our students, our faculty, and our staff that we will figure it out and we will make it work. Now, the third strategy of reinvention is to increase student support services. I will remind you that we have added tutoring centers, math centers, career centers, transfer centers, wellness centers, and veteran centers at every college, and we have cut the student to advisor ratio by two-thirds. A few years back, some people inside of city colleges literally told me our students were beyond help. Sadly, we still hear that refrain. We didn't listen then, and we're not listening now. We've looked beyond the excuses, and we have found a way again to make it work. The fourth strategy is improved operations. When I arrived at City Colleges, I found a lack of financial discipline. City Colleges only reconciled and closed its books once a year. There was little budget transparency, and the seven colleges were run like their own little independent kingdoms, meaning there were administrative redundancies everywhere. Now that led to another popular excuse when I started. We can't help our students because there just isn't enough money. People simply couldn't imagine a different way of doing things, and their first instinct was to call for more resources when all we needed was to be more resourceful. We consolidated back office functions at the district office, and to date we've cut administrative overhead by 6%. We've insourced a lot of expensive vendor contracts, and that has led to 66 million in savings that have been reinvested in the classroom, helping us secure and maintain a AA credit rating that is fueling our capital plan. As you may recall, under reinvention, we launched a $524 million capital plan to address decades of deferred maintenance. As part of that plan, we decided to build a $251 million new Malcolm X College and manage the project ourselves. Immediately, I heard, it hasn't been done this way. The public sector can't pull this off, and you can't do it in that time frame. Well, this upcoming January, Mary, Mary Manuel and I will open a new Malcolm X College on the west side, two years after we broke ground. <laughs> yes, again, we made it work with an on-time, on-budget delivery. Now, 
I would like to also tell you that we will be soon cutting the ribbon on the new 100,000 square foot transportation distribution and logistics center at Olive Harvey College, a facility that is one tenth the size of Malcolm X and for which construction started at the same time. But that project is being managed by the state of Illinois and it was stopped <laughs> dead in its tracks on June 30th due to the budget crisis denying our students a facility that should be preparing them for the 110,000 TDNL jobs coming to our region. But we're fighting, and we're fighting very hard to get this project back on track because that's the least we can do when we see how much adversity some of our students overcome to reach their goals. Let's take Howard Spiller. Howard has been taking five classes a semester at Daly College and he has been accepted into our guaranteed admissions program with UIC. Now that's the headline. The story behind the headline includes leaving high school without a diploma, surviving with the help from food pantries, developing an autoimmune disease, and overcoming two strokes. Now Howard has had every excuse in the world to give up. But Howard told me, and I quote, Chancellor, giving up simply is not an option. Howard, I'd like for you to wave because he came here with me today. <laughs> now I submit that if Howard can achieve all that he has, and that if a girl named Cheryl from the projects on the west side of Chicago can end up a few months ago in Seattle discussing the future of education with Bill Gates, as I was privileged to do, we should not ever accept excuses from ourselves or from anyone around us. You see, reinvention isn't an initiative. Reinvention is a mindset that doesn't allow excuses and insist on finding a way to make it work. The biggest obstacle to taking reinvention to its fullest extent and making it stick is not the challenges of our students we serve or the decreasing state and federal funding. Similarly, the biggest barrier our students face isn't their zip code, it isn't their skin color, it isn't their finances, it's not even the holes in their education, and it's certainly not that they have to catch a bus from one college to another. The biggest barrier is having people in their lives, in their colleges, telling them that their, cir their circumstances mean they can't succeed, that it means that they can't make it work. So the next time you see someone who feels like it's all just too much, especially a city college student or staff person, tell them no excuses, and together let's continue to figure out how to make it work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Cheryl, and I'm sure, given that applause and everything else, I'm sure there are a lot of critical questions coming at you from the, uh, from the audience, so if you have a... I'm not uh, taking questions. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> Got to succeed. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving on. All right. Uh, by the way, for the record, four years, City College, a Chicago employee. Remember that. Okay. Uh, you have the forms. Do we have any questions? Well, Amanda, I didn't see you doing your usual. Okay. Uh, this is from always the last name is always a winner, isn't it? But I'm going to go through this. Janice Bell Zarushka. How close? Of course. <laughs> dubja, dubja. Okay, here we go. What is the civic mission? By the way, excellent printing. What is the civic mission of city colleges? That's not what it says, Paul. Oh. Doesn't? Yeah. Oh, she. How can city colleges be more. Thank you for helping me out, Chancellor. 
How can city colleges be more in, in, international in preparing students? Intentional. Oh. Intention. Our Great friends. printing, Our lousy friends. eyes. <laughs> How can city colleges be more intentional in preparing students for civic life and community engagement? Hmm. From the Robert Mark McCormick Foundation. Should I answer it? You want to take it? <laughs> As you can see, me and Paul have a very loving relationship. Um, there are several ways, um, and that's a very good question because Aliana Blancas, who is our student trustee of our board of directors, is here somewhere with me. Um, she is uh, very involved in working with our SGA groups to make sure we figure out a way to get students more actively engaged in what's happening in their lives, in their career, and in government, quite frankly. A lot of laws, a lot of things happen, both in Springfield and in D.C., that influence a lot of things that we have to do. And a lot of times, students don't know that. And a lot of times, it's not positive change. And I believe if students had a greater voice in what happens, then I think they could be uh, the strongest influencers. So she's working with the SGA groups, and we're working with several other groups um, external groups, government groups, to get our students more engaged. Well, any other questions that I could read uh, brilliantly as I did the last one? <laughs> Easy stuff. Don't. Okay, Cheryl, yeah. before we let you go. Not another moment. <laughs> I'm going to give, with your permission, can I give the mug to my nephew? Would that be all right? Yes. All right. But before you go, uh, as you may know, the City College of Chicago establishes uh, this Thomas Roser Award, a scholarship for each year for two students. You know, some of you may not know Tom Roser, but for many years he was the person who kept this club alive. Uh, these two tables would have been a big meeting for the City Club. And uh, I, in his name, we've established the Thomas uh, Roser Award, and we have two students here who will receive this award, and I think it's, is it, 4,000? 4,000 for each student. So here we go. Frank Mendez, where are you? He went to the restroom. He went what? He went to the restroom. As luck would have it, he went to the restroom. Excellent. Moving on. Do we have Shianti Jones here? Yeah, all right. Not easy, is it? Shianti, please stand. A nursing major currently attending Kennedy King, Ms. Jones is a former tattoo artist, was born with severe form of scoliosis and has acquired a restrictive lung disease. During one of her many hospital stays, she experienced the care and support of many nurses who cried, laughed, and encouraged her. Ms. Jones became so impressed with these healthcare professionals that she made a decision to become a nurse. Her goal is to not only provide patients with medical care, but also to uplift them mentally and emotionally. How about a big round of applause for that young lady? And if Frank didn't have to go to the restroom, he's an information technology major at Harold Washington. He expects to graduate in the fall of 2015. He was born in El Salvador until the age of, he stayed there until the age of 11. He's attended Harold Washington and helped him to see how society works. And as a result, the mayor's still here? Okay, good. He wants to pursue a career involving politics and computers. <laughs> His goals include assisting communities with limited access to education and helping other young immigrants to overcome language barriers. Let's hear it for him. Yes. Cheryl, yes. my favorite chancellor of City College. <laughs> right, Mr. President? Until, Chuck? Don't say it. Don't say it. All right, I won't say it. My former president is now the oh, let's give him a round of applause. The, the chairman of the board of the city college is Chuck Middleton. Because tenure is such a beautiful word, I occasionally told him he's the best president Roosevelt ever had, Roosevelt University, until the next one. <laughs> Keep that in mind, Corey. So, Chancellor Hyman, a one-year membership to the City College of Chicago. And thank you for donating your mug, this incredible mug that of all people Donald Trump took to Corey Thompson. Give it to you. We will. We are uh, adjourned, and let's give one more round of applause for the chancellor.